This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Mr. Robert P. Watson and his new book, The Nazi Titanic, The Incredible Untold Story of a Doomed Ship in World War II. Mr. Watson is a prominent historian and frequent political commentator. He is the author or editor of 36 books, including America's First Crisis, which received a 2014 gold medal in history from the Independent Publishers Association. In this book, he tells the story of the German ocean liner Cap Arcona. Once one of the most celebrated luxury liners in the world, the Cap Arcona would have a long and complicated history, culminating in one of the most tragic and little known incidents in World War II. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Robert P. Watson. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, everybody. And uh, I love this bookstore. I've been coming here for years. And we were just saying how I, I regret or lament the fact that too, much, uh, too many bookstores like this have been lost around the country due to technology. But this is a real resource for the community. Uh, OK, the story tonight, um, my whole career, this is year 26 for me as a professor and an author. And I've always said the following, that there's more we don't know about history than we do know about history. We know very little about history, even events as momentous as the Second World War or the Holocaust. Case in point, uh, the late great librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, had something he called the law of the unread. And what Borston meant by that was this, that over 99% of the books ever written are gone. They've been burned lost, decomposed, or destroyed on purpose. Therefore, if we try to make sense out of something 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago, we're using less than a percent of the written record. And I remember when I first heard that in graduate school, my thought was, that means we know less than 1% about the Revolutionary War, less than 1% about George Washington, and far less than 1% the further we go back. What I've always advocated in my work, and, and my corollary that I teach and write about to Borston's Law of the Red, on the Red is this. The same challenge that faces an historian is the same challenge that faces a paleontologist. A paleontologist studies ancient life, a dinosaur, T-Rex. Here's the problem for a paleontologist. Only the hard parts of history survive. A tooth, a claw, a footprint in the dried mud from 65 million years ago. All the soft parts of history are gone. The skin. We don't know what color T-Rex was. We don't know if T-Rex had spots, stripes, feathers. We don't know what they smelled like. We don't know what they sounded like. We don't know what their eye color was. We don't know how they hunted. We don't know how they slept. We don't know how they mated. I've always imagined with uh, great care and difficulty, uh, Mrs. T-Rex was bigger than Mr. T-Rex. But it's the same thing with history. In history, all the hard parts are here, but we've lost all the soft parts. So what we have in history are the castles, the cannons, and the crowns, as I always write. But what we're missing are all the things that breathe life into the human adventure, the human experience. That is, the love letters, the poems, the musical scores, the recipes, dances, games children played. So we know about this war, and we know about a war 50 years later, but what happened in between? The day-to-day -day lives of most people are gone because the soft parts of history are gone. So even something like World War II or the Holocaust, there's more we don't know than we do know. I'm one of these folks who every year as a history nerd, I collect all these stories where someone needs a new uh, frame for a painting. They go to some small town in Nebraska to a yard sale. They see a painting, they buy the painting for the frame, they tear the painting out, and behind it is a Van Gogh. Every year that happens, right? Or they tear the painting out, and an unknown letter from Benjamin Franklin falls out. This happens every year. Well, behind the painting was another unknown story. So here's what happened. I never intended to write this book. I was going to write a book on the last week of World War II. That's one of the few aspects of the war that we've pretty much ignored. The last week was defined by chaos. There were instances of just brutal murder in the final moments of the war and Holocaust. And there were examples of great humanity and magnanimity in the final moments. 
But overall, we lost a lot of that because when the war ends, no one wants to focus on the bad. They wanted to move beyond the war. Then we have to pivot to the war in the Pacific. You have the dropping of the bomb, the rise of the Cold War, the Marshall Plan, the Manhattan Project, the creation of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And history seems to have forgotten that last week. So that was going to be my book. And what I was going to do is each day in that last week, I was going to tell a story of an individual to try to personalize that last week. Each day, a story of love, a story of loss, a story of triumph, a story of tragedy. So I'm going through trying to find a story each day. And I find this letter, to, right in the last moments of the war. It's from a British major who was sent after the war ended to study and find out what happened in the final moments. His name was Till, T-I-L-L. -L. And Till says, the single bloodiest hour of the entire Holocaust occurred as the peace treaty was being signed. It was the most unimaginable tragedy that he had ever seen or ever thought of. So I got that and I said, wow, I never heard of this. So I called prominent Holocaust scholars and I said, what's this event? And they said, well, it didn't happen. So I called prominent World War II historians and said, what's this event? And they said, it didn't happen. So I reluctantly put it away and continued to look for other stories. I come across another letter by a British general. His name was Mills Roberts. He was a tough general of the British 6th Commando, a special forces unit, a long career in service, a really tough, old school kind of general. And he's writing about the report that Till was making. And he says, in my entire time in uniform, there is one nightmare I will never get over. The most unimaginable tragedy when thousands and thousands and thousands of innocent people, Holocaust prisoners, all died as the ink was drying on the peace treaty. And I said, oh my gosh, what is this? So I called prominent Holocaust scholars back and said, I have this letter. Everybody said, never heard of it, doesn't exist. I contacted the Holocaust Museum, Shoah Foundation. By the way, these groups have been fantastically helpful, so don't misconstrue. I contacted the World War II Museum in New Orleans, the Imperial War Museum in London. Everybody said, no, nobody's ever heard of it. But I stayed with it and kept digging and digging, and the trail led me back to the British archives. What happened in the final moments of the war, after this unimaginable tragedy occurred, in a bureaucratic snafu, someone decided to seal all the military reports, the interviews, the paperwork, everything. And it was locked away in the British archives. I imagine that final moment in Indiana Jones. You remember he finds the Lost Ark? And they put it in a crate. They go down into the basement of the National Archives. And someone puts it in row 37, subsection L, next to 10,000 other objects. And it sat there for decades and decades and decades. But they released the information. Have I picked your, picked your interest, interest? OK, here's the story. So the Germans loved their ships. Over the last hundred and some years, many of the greatest ships made were made by Germany. And the shipping industry in Germany back in the early 1900s was something like the car industry in the US in the 50s or 60s. Not just an economic engine, but we had a car culture. We loved our cars. The Germans loved their ships. World War I was particularly difficult for the Germans because not only was the country, as the belligerent nation, not only were they hit hard after the war, their economy went belly up, but they lost most of their ships. They were either sunk, confiscated, or the remaining ships were taken to Scotland to a place, Scapa Flow, and the, the, the victorious nations were going to take them. The German admirals and political leaders felt so strongly about their ships, then rather than let their ships be taken by the victors, they sunk their ships, they scuttled their ships. I want you to remember that point. We're going to come back to that in about 20 minutes. So fast forward. After the First World War, Hamburg, South America, a huge shipping company, Hamburg Sud, S-U-D, along with Blum and Voss, a huge shipbuilder on the North German coast, decided they were going to make the greatest ship ever. They were going to redo the Titanic. Titanic 2.0, only they were going to study the original Titanic and engineer out any design flaws, a reinforced hull, more life uh, boats, etc. And in 1927, they launched the greatest ship afloat, the CAP, C-A-P, Arcona, A-R-C-O-N-A. 
And in the 1920s and 30s, this was the most celebrated ship afloat. Uh, it was a technological marvel. Clark Gable and all the A-list actors in Hollywood went on it. All the European monarchs went on it. It was a veritable who's who. I found old newspaper articles from around the world in the late 20s and 30s when the Cap Arcona would be sailing into some port. They would start a countdown. In 10 days, the Titanic will be here. Nine days, eight days, seven days. People would gather at the port, rush to it behind fences just to get a glimpse of the Titanic, if you will. Uh, it traveled to Buenos Aires, Argentina often. There were tangos written. There was a Cap Arcona tango. When I was a little boy, I had uh, NFL player cards that I collected. In Germany, they had cards with the officers of the Cap Arcona. This was the most celebrated ship afloat in the 20s and 30s. Now, of course, Hitler rises to power in 33, World War II, etc. The ship takes a turn for the worse. It's Hitler's favorite ship. Lo and behold, the Hitler loved ships when he was a little boy. Uh, it's Joseph Goebbels' favorite ship, the propaganda minister. The ship becomes nicknamed the Nazi Titanic. Hitler uses it for propaganda purposes, telling the world, look, your ship sunk, look at ours. Everybody travels on ours. Now, as World War II started, the ship was sent to the Polish coast, present-day Gdynia. The Germans had renamed it Gottenhofen after they took over the area, and it sat there rusting. 1942, things would change. The war had taken a turn for the worse. The, Brit uh, the British Air Force held off the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, when they tried to invade Britain. And Winston Churchill gives that great speech about the few who did it. The Russian winter sets in, and countless German soldiers freeze to death and die on the Eastern Front. Through 42, it's apparent that the Nazis will lose the war. Not if, but when. So Hitler has a meeting with Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda minister. And this is what he comes up with, a harebrained idea. He charges Goebbels with the following. You need to come up with an epic, diabolical propaganda scheme. The most epic and diabolical in history. And it's going to be so epic and diabolical, it's going to help us to win the war. It's going to destroy the Americans and the British and, and, and rally the, the world behind the Germans. Now, what was this epic, diabolical plot? They didn't know. But here's what Hitler and Goebbels did know. They loved Hollywood movies. This is where their idea comes from. Western films were banned inside Nazi Germany, but they would have agents steal them and bring them in. And Hitler and Goebbels would watch movie after movie after movie. It was not uncommon for them to do three back to back to back with translators and interpreters in their ear. I went through and looked and reread Goebbels' diaries. I read Hitler's aides, like Martin Berman's, uh, Borman's diaries, to try to find out what they were watching and what was the impact of Hollywood. These guys would sit for hours after a movie analyzing it. They were sort of the German Siskel and Ebert, one might say. They fancied themselves film connoisseurs. Uh, the movies they watched the most, as best as I could tell, one of the three favorite movies was Gone with the Wind. Not a bad film. One of the three favorite movies was King Kong, the old one. And it appears that the movie that Hitler watched the most, are you ready for this? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> Remember, it was a German maiden in the Black Forest and all that. Uh, they watched it over and over and over again. The movie they did not like, the movie they hated the most, Casablanca. Why? Because it was a propaganda film wrapped up in a great drama, romance, action format. They hated that. So one day they're sitting and watching movies, and the movie they watched left them so emotional that rather than do their Siskel and Ebert critique, they just sat there and they watched the credits. Now, I don't know what movie that was. Unfortunately, they didn't write which movie it was. But while watching the credits, something dawned on them. A lot of the producers, directors, actors, cinematographers, uh, script writers, screenwriters were Jews. And Goebbels wrote that in an outrage, he kicks over all the chairs in the, in, the, in the theater. That's when they come up with their diabolical scheme. Here's the propaganda scheme that's going to be the world's most epic and diabolical. They want to declare war against Jewish Hollywood and prove that the Nazis and the Aryans make the world's greatest movies. So Joseph Goebbels is signed by Hitler to make the world's greatest propaganda film. So epic and diabolical, it will turn the tide of the war. 
Simultaneously, Hitler charges him with creating Hollywood on the Rhine to compete. And this movie is going to change the world. Now, what is this movie? Well, here's what he says. The kind of movies that Joseph Goebbels made were very juvenile, ham-fisted, obvious propaganda. For example, two of the more famous was a movie, Judge Seuss and Dare Vigor Jude, the Eternal Jew. These movies were just ridiculous. The plot was the same in all of them. An idyllic little German village, a Jewish guy moves in, he's like Dracula. Uh, it gets dark when he walks around, the foreboding, foreshadowing music builds, rats scurry behind him, young girls disappear, the villagers rise up and kill the guy and everything's good in the end. That's the movies he makes. But Hitler says, we can't make these movies anymore. Goebbels wants to make movies like Casablanca. So they're going to make the greatest movie ever made. Cast of Thousands, Cecil B. DeMille, one of those. Uh, they decide to make the Titanic. Only they're going to make the Nazi version of the Titanic. They know who the star of the movie is going to be. The German ship made after the Titanic, the Nazi Titanic, the pride of the Third Reich, Hitler's favorite ship, Goebbels' favorite ship. Now they cast all the most beautiful models, the best actors. They reassign military units to be the extras, the cast of thousands. The problem is most of the great directors are either in concentration camps, dead, or had fled to the U.S. They do find a guy named Herbert Selpin, S-E-L-P-I-N. He makes kind of muscular dramas slash adventure, kind of like an Indiana Jones. A lot of his movies are about a German guy that dresses like Indiana Jones. He goes to Africa, fights the locals, finds a treasure, gets the girl, lives happily ever after. So they hire Selpine. They release the largest budget. This was the most expensive movie ever made at the time. Now, the problem for the Nazis is everything that could go wrong goes wrong. For example, they want to film an accurate depiction of the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic sunk at night. But all of Germany is under a blackout at night, no lights because of Allied bombing. Hitler and Goebbels give an exemption, so they have these giant ballyhoo-type lights. They're going to film at night. It gets bombed by an Allied bombing raid. <laughs> the most beautiful actress, who's the star of the movie, gets pregnant from one of the soldiers. Everything goes wrong. Hitler's increasingly desperate. The war's going bad. Where's his movie? It's over budget. It's behind schedule. Goebbels is desperate. The movie's behind schedule, over budget. Uh, they're leaning on the director, Herbert Selpin. One day, Selpin's drinking. He comes in agitated. Everything's a mess on the set. He curses the actors, curses the Nazi party, curses Goebbels, and curses the Fuhrer. He's summoned to Berlin. Goebbels has him hanged. Surprisingly, they couldn't find another director willing to take over the movie. Uh, the Gestapo's on set. You're an actor who missed your cue. Bang. Get me the understudy. Finally, after over-budget delays, the movie's done. Before they open up Hollywood on the, line, on, the, on the Rhine and launch this diabolical epic propaganda film to win the war, Goebbels sits for a private screening. When he's watching the movie, something dawns on him. The movie's basically about an insane fanatical captain that drives a ship into an iceberg and all the innocent people are doomed. It's a metaphor for Nazi Germany with Hitler as the captain. He realizes that this is how it will be seen. He cans the movie and orders copies destroyed. It can't be shown inside of Germany. Fortunately, pirated copies made it to Prague, Paris. And today you can see the black and white in English subtitles. I've watched it. Uh, it's a very disturbing film to watch, but cinematography-wise, it's brilliant. Do you all know that before James Cameron made his great Titanic, which is a good film, I think Cameron's a genius, but I think there's a better version of the Titanic. That would be the old British film, the black and white from the 50s, A Night to Remember, anyone? Uh, all the sinking and ship scenes from A Night to Remember are the Nazi Titanic. The British director took all the footage because it was so well done and they actually sunk and killed people in, in the making of the movie. Um, so after the movie, fast forward again, there's a thousand other things in the book, but in the name of time, the ship sent back to the Polish coast. Now, we're in the winter of 1945, March of 45. The war is ending. Obviously, the Nazis are going to lose the war. Hitler issues his infamous liquidation decree, destroy all the concentration camps, all the papers, and kill all the prisoners. And concentration camp commandants just commit wholesale murder. Shortly after that, though, Heinrich Himmler 
issues a sort of countermanding decree. He says, don't kill and liquidate all the folks. He says, don't let anyone fall into allied hands. Now, what does he mean by that? He purposely made it vague because if Hitler and other Nazis say, what do you mean? He could say, oh, I meant kill everyone. Here's what he wants. He wants roughly 100,000 Holocaust prisoners to be saved, given to him. He wants two things. One, he wants to negotiate a separate surrender with Eisenhower on the Western Front to move all of his soldiers to the Eastern Front because it's the Russians, the Soviets, the Red Army that they're worried about. The Red Army is marching from the East and they are murdering, torturing every single person in every single village, leaving behind just a swath of terror. The second thing Himmler wants, how could Eisenhower and Montgomery, he reasons, say no if he were to give 100,000 Holocaust survivors in exchange for his life? So here's what he wants. He spreads the word among commandants of, of concentration camps in Germany. They can't march their survivors south. We're coming up, the Americans from Italy. They can't go east. They can't go west. The only place to go, north. So he wants them march to Neuengamme concentration camp, which is near Hamburg, which is in north central Germany, not far, 60 miles from the Baltic coast. Then what he's going to do is he's going to have a ship there and all these survivors are going to be loaded onto the ship, and he, Himmler, will get on, and he will go and exchange his life with Eisenhower. Now, which ship would they bring? There is only one ship they could bring, the pride of the Third Reich. He's, Himmler's got to go out in style, the, the greatest ship ever, the Nazi Titanic, the Cap Arcona. Now, there's a Swedish count, an aristocrat named Folke Bernadotte, a real dashing fellow, looks a wee bit like... Uh, uh, James Bond when Roger Moore played him, kind of that look. Uh, Bernadotte realizes that as the war ends, the Nazis will kill everyone in the camps. He says, I need to go try to save people in the final, last couple of days, weeks of the war. So he also hears a rumor that Himmler wants to cut a deal. So Bernadotte goes to Himmler and says, I know Eisenhower in Montgomery. I can facilitate the deal. He lied. He didn't know either one but he plays Himmler like a guitar. He says, but here's the deal. I need a gesture from you that you, I can trust you. I need you to give me all the Scandinavian prisoners in the camps. And he does. And Bernadotte has his famous white buses, about three dozen white buses and ambulances and two white ships. He takes the Scandinavians back to Sweden. Then he comes back and tells Himmler, okay, I talked to Ike in Montgomery, which he didn't, and they're willing to do the deal, but they need a sign from you that you're willing to work with us. We need the French. So Himmler says he'll give you all the French from the concentration camps. But right when Himmler's ready to do the deal, Hitler learns that Himmler is doing the deal. Hitler sends two assassins to kill Himmler. Himmler takes off his uniform, gets fake, a fake identity as a police sergeant, and goes on the run. So Bernadotte shows up at the camp, and he can't get the French. So he goes back to Sweden and loads his white buses and his white ambulances with art, treasure, gold. He goes back and bribes the commandant. I need an annoying Gama camp. But they make him go into the camp to get the prisoners. He sees the condition of the prisoners. He's distraught. He rescues a few thousand French and women. He puts them in his buses and ambulances and ships and takes them back to Sweden. He vows, I'll be back now for the Jews. He's getting gold treasure and racing back to the camp. Uh, by this time, we're in late April. The war's ready to end in May. Adolf Hitler kills himself in the bunker. Cyanide, bullet, and his body's burned. Joseph Goebbels brings his wife and six children to the bunker, puts the kids in pajamas with a little teddy bear, kills all of them, kills himself. Himmler's on the run, gets caught. Hermann Goering is on the run, would get caught. There's no command structure. Folke Bernadotte races back to the camp and arrives right after they had abandoned the camp. Tens upon tens of thousands of people march north to the Baltic. He arrives at the camp to see just absolute carnage. They were doing tuberculosis tests on little kids at the camp. The kids that had been infected and studied, they killed all of them before they left and headed north. Bernadotte and his people in their white buses could follow the bodies straight north to the Baltic. So many people died. Tens of thousands, it's estimated, died on the worst death march in history. 
When Bernadotte arrives at the Baltic coast, there are tens of thousands of people piled up at the port. He could smell the, the death before they arrived. Why? People went north in three ways, some in barges pulled by tugboats, some on foot, and some in trains and cattle wagons. What happened was when the Nazis arrived at the coast in the trains, they took their uniforms off, put on civilian clothes, and ran like hell. They never unlocked the train cars. There are 100 to 150 people dead and have been there for days in the train cars. It takes days to bury everyone. Bernadotte's at the coast. People hadn't been fed. It's just chaos. People are lying and dying at the port. But they say out there at that ship, the Titanic, three kilometers off the coast of Neustadt in Lubeck Bay, north central Germany in the Baltic, there is a ship loaded with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Bernadotte goes out to the ship. He says they could smell the ship from the port. He said when they got on ship, everyone was violently sick. They had crammed thousands of people into each hold and each room. When they open up the holds, the smell of death was overpowering. It was pitch black dark, no food, no water for days, no running facilities. People were living in a half foot deep of urine and feces. He said there were just bodies like sardines. Those that lived had to pile up the dead and sleep on the dead so they wouldn't sleep in feces and urine. Bernadette bribes everyone and takes about 1,600 Jews off the ship and the port and races. Now we're into May. The war's ending any minute. Races back to Sweden, vows I'll be back for the rest. He's getting gold, treasure, money to bribe to race back to the Baltic. Now, there's no command structure at the Baltic. No one knows what to do. The two commanders at the Baltic, one was the top Gestapo official. His name was Count George von Basewitz Bear. B-E-H-R. The other one was the guy who was basically the mayor of Hamburg, uh, the lead politician. His name was Karl Kaufmann, with a K and a K. Kaufmann calls base of its bear and comes up with a plan. I have two objectives. Number one, let's kill everyone. We'll load them all on the ship. Number two, what did the Germans do after World War I at Scapa Flow? They scuttled their ships rather than lose them. We cannot let the Fuhrer's favorite ship our beloved Nazi Titanic, the pride of the Third Reich, the greatest ship. We'll put them all on the ship and we'll sink the ship. But that's not diabolical enough. We will wait until the peace is being signed. We'll give an order and then we'll sink it as one final gesture. Many, many, many thousands more will die on this than died on the Titanic. It will replace the Titanic as the world's most tragic maritime disaster. This is the plan. So people on the coast are you know, dying, it's, it's a panic, it's chaos, there's no food, there's no water, and the British are on the outskirts of the town. The sixth commando, the intelligence officer for them was a fellow named Ian Fleming, who would go on to write some pretty good James Bond books. Uh, the British are coming into town. The two units of Germans in town, there are no regulars, not the Wehrmacht. There is the Volkstrom, which are just a couple of old men with an old gun, and Hitler Youth. The Volkstrom either surrender or are overrun in minutes. The Hitler Youth run into the woods. The British 6th Commando come in. They make quick work of the Nazis and take over and secure the town. They're followed by the Scottish 15th and some tanks. And the British secure the town. Now, meanwhile, thousands of people in the port haven't eaten, you know, are dying, and they're saying this ship is filled with folks. And Carl, Carl Kaufman ordered that the ship be filled with gasoline so that it would blow better, burn better. But the British need to secure the port before they go out to the ship. As they're signing the peace, the order is given by presumably Kaufman and Count George von Basewitz Bear, and a U-boat, a sub from a nearby naval base, goes out to sink the ship. It's shallow, so before the sub can dive, the tanks, the British tanks, come up and open fire, and they sink the sub, saving thousands and thousands of people. Peace is signed, it's all over, and then they hear the roar. Six squadrons of British heavy bombers fly into the bay, and they all open up on the Nazi Titanic, blowing it up out of the water in, in a giant fireball. They are typhoon bombers. Typhoon bombers carry a 500-pound bomb, 60-pound rockets the size of me, and on the wings they have 20-millimeter cannons, massive machine guns. They come in, they unload everything they have, blowing up the ship, killing thousands and thousands instantly. Thousands are blown into the air, thousands are blown overboard. 
The Baltic in May is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. People were skeletal, hadn't eaten, had been abused, hypothermia, or they sink under the waves. Those that managed to grab a table or wood and try to stay afloat, after the six squadrons of typhoons bombed it, they turn around and with their heavy cannons and machine guns, they strafe those in the water, killing those in the water. They swing around and go to the port. And there are thousands of people in striped uniforms at the port. They strafe the port. One fellow, one pilot, in the records that have been released, the, the bullets these things shot were the size of a tube of toothpaste. He described sawing people in half, that torsos would just split all the way up and down the port. And then they flew back to um, their bases. They also hit the tugboats pulling the barges. Tugboat captains quick cut the barges loose. Some barges flipped or sunk, killing hundreds in each barge. One barge floated ashore. And you remember the one letter I told you about General Mills Roberts, the tough British commander? A barge floats ashore. There are maybe 150 Holocaust prisoners in the barge. It's a deep barge that was designed to carry coal or stone or some sort. They're trying to climb up out. The Hitler Youth runs out of the forest, climbs up on the edge of the barge, and machine guns the people in the barge. Mills Roberts and his special forces see this, and they're racing to stop it. He writes and says, rather than surrender, rather than fight the British, rather than run for your freedom, their last efforts on this earth were to kill innocent people. Mills Roberts said, it's the only time in my long career I wasn't a gentleman or an officer. He said, I told my men, kill every one of them with your bare hands. And he was proud of it. Some people were blown off the ship into the water. One of them was a guy named Francis Akos, A-K-O-S. He was the principal violinist, once upon a time, for the Hungarian Jewish Symphony. He was captured, he was taken aboard uh, in multiple con uh, concentration camps, the Death March, and aboard the Nazi Titanic. Akos is blown overboard. He sees a passing British ship, a, a German ship, I'm sorry, a small German boat, and they're trying to rescue some of the German guards that were in the water. He knows some German, he hollers out, they pick him up, they put him on board, they realize he's a Holocaust prisoner, so they throw him back in the Baltic. He manages to make it ashore with a handful of other survivors who wash up onto the beach and they're too weak to stand. They're lying in the sand. Uh, Another group of Hitler youth comes out. They're out of bullets, but with the butt of their guns, they bash in the skulls of the people there. Akos goes back into the water, somehow with the energy to get back in the water. Akos eventually comes ashore and is rescued. He lives through the ordeal. He moves to Chicago, where he becomes the principal violinist for decades of the Chicago Symphony. He retires as the concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony. Francis Akos died this past December. There were two brothers that were on this ship, Beric and Jozek Jakubowicz. They were Polish, as the name would suggest. They were locked into a hold. And as the ship was hit and starts to list and is blowing up in a fireball, some of the brave prisoners, rather than run for their lives, they went below deck to open up the holds for those trapped. Beric and Jozek are trapped, they're ready to die. Someone opens the door. They run out with their liberators, and they're racing down a hallway. They get to the end of the hallway, they open the door, and it's a fireball. They slam the door, and they run back. There's a fireball at the other end. They're trapped in the hallway. The flames are coming in. The brothers see a vent, an opening. One lifts the other up. They open it, climbs up. As he's pulling the other brother up, a wall of fire incinerates everybody in the hallway. But the brothers make it on deck. They, the ship is rolling now in a heavy list. One of the massive funnels breaks loose, rolls across the deck, just crushing everybody that's scrambling on the deck. They tie themselves to the railing. But as the ship lists further and further and is ready to roll over, they climb, they scamper to the bottom of the ship. On the bottom of the ship, they're waiting. The problem is the fires inside are so intense that it is literally cooking alive everybody on the ship. Beric realizes they will not survive. He tells Jozek, we've got to get off the ship. Jozek cannot swim, Beric can. Beric goes down the anchor line into the water. Jozek stays on board, they offer their goodbyes. Beric is picked up by a German fisherman who was sympathetic to what was happening. 
They never found his name out because he was worried the Nazis would kill him. He takes Barrack ashore and to a bakery. There's no food in the bakery, but they have burlap sacks that they brought flour in. Ironically enough, he lights the oven and leans against the oven all night to stay warm and stay alive. In the morning, the doors kicked down, and he thought the Nazis were coming to kill him. It was the British. They took him to a hospital. In the adjacent wing is his brother, Jozak. The British went out late that night to the ship to get people off the ship. Everyone on the bottom was baked to death except Jozak, who sat on the dead bodies. Jozak was rescued. Barrick and Jozak moved to Boston. They both became successful businessmen. Jozak died maybe 20 years ago, Barrick 15. Uh, Barrick's wife is still alive, living just north of Boston. The incidents continue and continue. After the war, Count George von Basewitz Bear, the Gestapo official, was captured by the British, turned over to the Russians. They sent him to Siberia, and he was killed. Carl Kaufman, the mastermind behind this tragedy, went to one of the post-war tribunals. There was more than just Nuremberg. Uh, there was one in Hamburg, for example. He was found innocent and let go. He lives a long, comfortable life and dies of natural causes. Who would have thought? Here we are seven decades out from the end of the war and the end of the Holocaust, thinking that we know all there is to know. When their history still has her secrets, not only does she have her secrets, she has some whoppers. I can't even imagine the stories that are still out there from this. This particular story constitutes history's worst instance of friendly fire. The absolute worst maritime disaster in the world. It constitutes the single bloodiest hour of the Holocaust, and it's the final tragedy of World War II, and we know virtually nothing about it even after 70 years. So we need to continue to dig. I've always said I believe for the words never again to truly mean never again. We need to tell every generation. We need to tell the stories for those that died and as well for the future generations, and that's um, a Nazi Titanic. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. I'll go one, two, and then. Is there an estimate of how many people actually died? I provide estimates in the book. Um, first off, let me say we just don't know. While the Nazis took meticulous records, they were evacuating the camps in a rush, a race against time. As they were marching north, people that stumbled or tried to relieve themselves or tie a shoe were killed on spot. Uh, the Nazi guards were running away in the middle of the night. Um, so we just don't know. It's possible that as many as 50,000 people died on the way to the Baltic. The most conservative estimate I can give you for how many prisoners died on the Nazi Titanic that day at the end of the war, at the least 4,500 people were on board the ship that died. It could have been 8,000. It could have been 10,000. Don't forget, there were hundreds, maybe thousands, that died in the days leading up who were thrown overboard. There were hundreds, if not thousands, that died at the port. There were hundreds, if not thousands, that died in the train cars. There were hundreds and thousands. So we don't, it could be tens of thousands perished uh, in that ordeal, at least 10 to 12,000 in that hour at a very, very cautious, conservative, safe minimum, 4,500 just on the Nazi Titanic. Ma'am? I wanted to know where you taught. I'm a professor at Lynn University, which is in Boca Raton, about an hour up the road without traffic. Uh, this is year 26 for me. I've taught from London to the University of Hawaii, from Yale to Stanford, from Northern Arizona to Georgetown. I've taught all over the place. Got married, and my wife and I decided to move to Paradise to be near her family, who lives in South Florida. So we've been here about 15, 16 years. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, you're welcome to come up and take the class. We lecture all over South Florida and, and uh, churches, synagogues, rotaries, convention centers, political clubs, bookstores, libraries. Uh, we get out and about. Was the story sealed because of this friendly fire? Okay. So, we don't know who it was. The question was, was this sealed, or the documents sealed because of friendly fire? We don't know who sealed them. We don't know exactly why. 
According to officials in London, um, it appears to have been a bureaucratic snafu. When Major Till and others come in after this and see bodies to the thousands, and they realize that they blew the ship up and killed thousands and thousands as the war ended, someone in a moment of horror, in a moment of self-realization, probably overreacted and said, we need to seal everything. The pilot's reports, the interviews taken with, by the officers on the scene with those who lived, the war records, the audio footage, photographs. I have a lot of photographs in here that have since been released. Video footage, all this uh, was locked away. Now, a couple of things. One, the British have a Secrets Act, and after 30 years, they open things up. But that's things they know of that have been requested. There were boxes and boxes and bo who knows what that just sat there collecting dust and, and cobwebs for seven plus decades. So um, we don't know exactly who did it. I'm hoping it comes out. We don't know the details. We do know that they went back into the coast later. And the Cap Arcona rolled over. She was such a big ship that she was bigger than the Baltic was deep three kilometers out. So she never sank. She rolled over, and it was a big hawk, like a beached whale, sticking partway out of the water. She sat there for four years and gradually moved in and moved in until she washed close to shore. In 1949, they collected the ship, broke it up for scrap. Tragically, there's no museum piece. There's no ship that remains. There's no masthead. There's no bell, something that we could It was all broken up for scrap. The Russians took some of it, others. And, and it's gone. gone, it's lost. Bodies by the thousands washed up, and British officers who were on the coast described just every day more and more bodies. The British dug a mass grave and buried thousands in a grave. Uh, something like three dozen nationalities were represented that day on that ship. Um, bodies washed ashore for years. In 1971, bones washed ashore. And German medical forensic experts said they believe that it was a young boy, the last Holocaust survivor from that day. 1971, the bones washed ashore in the, in the bay. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, when Goldos and Hitler did like movies and stuff, like when they were watching movies, I know they were not happy about Casablanca. How many movies they were being negative on besides Casablanca? Hitler and Goebbels watched so many films. They, again, they, were, they thought themselves film buffs. They watched hundreds of movies, and they watched some of the same movies over and over and over and over again. Um, they were always particularly frustrated when a British or an American film was an action drama but hit them. Went the Day Well was a classic old British black and white film, and it was, if I'm remembering correctly, I rewatched all this stuff. Um, there, the, the Nazis parachute into this village, and they're going to take the village over. And the villagers get pitchforks and shovels and fight back and kill the Nazis. And it ends with this great scene, the Nazis wanted to take over England, that once some farmer digs the last grave, puts the German in it, covers it up, and he goes, this is the only soil they're getting. So it was a very muscular kind of adventure drama, but behind it was a propaganda film, just like Casablanca. So what Hitler and Goebbels wanted was these Hollywood blockbusters that people didn't realize they were propaganda films, but the Nazis wanted to lace them with propaganda throughout, and not so ridiculously ham-fisted as Goebbels' earlier efforts uh, were. Who else has questions? We've got a few minutes. Ma'am? Yeah. Um, we came in a little bit late, okay. so I don't know if you talked about this. Um, so what took you to write about this? Why did I write this particular book? Yes. Uh, I write books on history, uh, American political history, the presidents, the first ladies, American military history, et cetera. So this is my first book about the Holocaust or about World War II uh, proper. I would say this, that maybe off the top of my head, maybe a third of the books I've done, I never intended to do. You start researching one thing and you find something else out that's more compelling. I never meant to write this. I wanted to write a book about the last couple of days of the war, and then I found a letter, a couple letters. And what would you have done? Didn't it 
it piqued my interest. I, I said, I, you know, how do you let this go? I never wrote that book. I probably never will because this just attracted me, and it's a story that had to be told. And I think, you know, every paleontologist dreams of putting a shovel on the ground and finding a new dinosaur. I think every historian dreams of finding a letter, and it turns out to change. Uh, I, you just wish it, this wasn't real. You wish it was something else. Um, but it's amazing how ideas and things come to you through the research process. We like to think that the historical process of discovery is purposeful and visionary, and we sit back and we think, I know that there are these letters in this, you know, and I'm going to go find them. No. You just start reading and digging and, and getting a phone call from someone that found something, and who knows what you'll find. And one of my early books uh, was on um, the First Ladies. This is years ago. I never intended to write the book. I was going, I don't laugh, but I was going to write a book on James K. Polk. I know, he was a president in the 1840s, but here's the thing. I know, I know. The first seven presidents were great men, and then we had a string of inept, incompetent, bumbling idiots until you get to Lincoln, number 16. Right in the middle of them is Polk, who's a capable, impressive guy, young, serves one term, dies right after he leaves office. It was Shakespearean. I never wrote the book because when I was doing research for Polk, I discovered Mrs. Polk. And I said, I'm writing about the wrong Polk. Sarah Childress <laughs> Polk was fascinating. I found, for example, they, were, they used to joke in the 1840s when the Polks would walk into a room, they would say, ladies and gentlemen, the president and Mr. Polk. Uh, there was a joke in the newspapers in the 1840s. They would say, Sarah Polk is certainly a master of herself, and we all suspect of someone else, too. Um, and then the Polk papers were preserved because he died just three months after leaving office after one term. Young man, too. And I got the papers, and I'm looking at the papers, and there's all this scribble in the margins. You know, cut this out, read the article I wrote for you, change this, what will send her so and so. Say. It's all in her handwriting. So I said, hey, she was Eleanor Roosevelt. She was Hillary Clinton. I'm writing about the wrong Polk. So instead of just writing about her, I decided to write about all the first ladies and the hidden influence and the powers, and that was many years ago. So you never intend to write something, and then you come across something and you go, have to write about that. Yes, ma'am. How long did it take you? It seems like you must have a huge amount of research. Um, how long did it take was the question. It, may have, it must have been, I know. It, it was an enormous amount of research. Um, I'm kind of a hard worker. I think I'm pretty disciplined. So I produce a book a year, sometimes more than that. But um, it, I spent about six months researching it just trying to track down letters, evidence, what happened, watching these old movies, rereading Goebbels' diary in English, just trying to figure out, is there enough there for a book, what happened? I kept coming up to a dead end, and I needed to have access to the documents. So after about six months, I kind of set it aside and started work on other books. And then the documents became available from the Imperial War Museum in London. They sent me countless documents by Dropbox. I didn't even have to go to London, right? They were, uh, I can't even tell you how helpful the Shoah Foundation, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and the Imperial War Museum were. Every single one of them got every single thing I requested, did it on their own time, and sent everything to me electronically. I never left my office in Boca to write this book. 10, 15 years ago, I had to apply for grants and fly out to Mount, Mount Vernon and spend a week in the basement and go to this battlefield and go to Europe and not anymore. Uh, it took me then, when I got all these documents, I read every day for about three or four months. But by every day, I mean eight hours a day. You know, I would do a full work day of just reading diaries, reading reports, listening to audio history, looking at old videos, movies, footage. And then it took me about six months to write the book. About six months to write. But that's working most every day. So, uh, yeah, so try to work on it. Yes, sir. Good. Is there a memorial to this? You know, with the Holocaust and World War II, there are songs, movies, great museums. We've yet to do a great song, a musical score. We don't have a great monument or memorial. We don't have a play. Hollywood has not yet told the story. We don't have the kind of things that we should have. On the German coast in the Baltic is a very, very small little museum. It's some guy's, you know, side of his house. 
and it's an area where every once in a while someone might walk up and say, what's this? Uh, there's one small memorial that was put at the site where the British buried thousands, and it sits and nestled in a quiet little hamlet in Germany, no tourist monuments, no, so that's about all that's there. Happily, um, we were able to get, uh, and I need to thank these people, um, my publisher, my literary agent, publicist had some good ideas. The concern was um, serious historians wouldn't believe that this was real. They would say this didn't happen. Um, we were worried that the public would think it was a novel. So we held the release of the book, which, you know, as an author, it kills you. You want it out. Uh, but what we decided is if we get leading noted people to go through all these records and verify that they exist. Uh, Michael Berenbaum, who everybody agrees is the greatest Holocaust scholar in the country, was kind enough to go through it. Uh, the great jurist Alan Dershowitz went through it all to, to check everything. Um, rabbi David Gordas, one of the world's most famous rabbis, looked at it. We had all these wonderful people were very, very helpful to me, uh, not only checking my work, but verifying that all this stuff is legitimate. The, um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, the Shoah Foundation, a number of folks, the Imperial War Museum all came on board and went through everything for us. And then with that, we felt like we could release it. Uh, in two weeks, I'm going to uh, New York City to meet with a group of about 110 uh, museum directors, rabbis, you know, Holocaust educators, World War II educators, uh, and to sit down with them and share what I just shared with all of you uh, with them so that we can turn all this material over uh, and allow it to find its way into textbooks, be talked about behind the pulpit, uh, to be lectured uh, in college classrooms in the K through 12 curriculum and so forth to get the story out. So I'm, you know, I'm thrilled. As an historian, this is, the, you know, this is like my birthday, right? I can't wait to go and tell everybody about it. Time for one or two more, sir. Holocaust Museum as a result of the book. Uh, do you know if they will incorporate any of this information into their uh, exhibits? The Holocaust Museum has expressed an interest in carrying it. Uh, we'll probably go there and talk. Uh, the question was, will the Holocaust Museum in Washington and others incorporate this material into their curriculum? Uh, I'm working on curriculum plans at all levels along with other people. Uh, we have a website. I want to expand it and upload documents. I want to invite the public who may have heard of this. For example, I had some people tell me that, you know, my grandfather used to talk about this, but no one believed him because it's, you know, it's not in the museums. And the people just thought, well, Grandpa's getting older, right? He said there was this ship. Um, so, yeah, there is some interest to include it into the curriculum, and we're in the process of doing all that. The book just came out two weeks ago. So I'm hopeful that the New York trip, we're going to go to Harvard, we're going to Toronto, we're going to Cleveland, we're going to Washington. So over the next two months, we're going to do the rounds and try to, this is one of the first uh, book talks, actually, uh, and the first bookstore on our list. Uh, so our hometown um, start here. So oh, I'm hopeful that over the next two months, I'm collecting a lot of business cards, I'm handing out a lot of business cards, that we can start to put this unknown secret uh, into the curriculum. Ma'am? Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to, Thursday, I'm going to the Fort Lauderdale, the main library downtown, and I think it's at 1 o'clock. But this is my only one in Miami, uh, bringing my business to books and books. Um, there will be a PBS show. You can get it on WXEL, your local PBS channel, later in the month. Uh, I don't know when they're releasing it. I, I haven't checked. But if you call your local PBS, you can find uh, they're going to do something on this uh, in about two or three weeks uh, later in the month. I want to especially thank Books and Books for the uh, invitation. This has always been one of my absolute favorite bookstores, and I've come here and sat there for years and come here and bought way too many books uh, and eaten too much, uh, had too much wine. But I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I'll be happy to hang around and answer questions. Thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, then a note to our internet audience watching at home. There's still time for you to call the number on your screen, and we can ship the Nazi Titanic to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Uh, for those of you here in the house, we have this book as well as, as several of um, Mr. Watson's previous books for sale at the counter in the front room over there. As he mentioned, he'll be signing here at the table to the left of the podium. And um, 
It's uh, lectures like this that uh, make you realize what a debt we owe to historians like Robert who try to see to it that stories like this aren't forgotten in history. Please give another hand to Robert Watson. Thank you very much. <laughs>